Well, good morning. You know, the word disciple literally means learner. And we had some great examples of learners and lifelong learners. One more time, can we celebrate those graduates? So grateful for all of them and the work they put in. What an example to all of us to continue to be learners and to be disciples of Jesus. And uh, man, I'm glad to be back in the book of Mark. It's been a few weeks, hasn't it, since we've been here in this, in this book. Uh, but I want to welcome you back to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. During the Jewish feast called Passover, this highly anticipated event among the Jews. And I want to welcome you back to the week that we call Passion Week. Okay, Passion Week, what normally comes to mind when we think about this week, it's a term we use in church tradition to describe the last week of Jesus' ministry on the earth. We might think about things like his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on that donkey. We might think about his last supper with his disciples. We might think about his arrest and betrayal, his crucifixion. And then we might think about his burial. And on the third day, he rose again from the grave. This is Passion Week. And these are the most notable events of Passion Week, but they're not the only events in Passion Week. A lot goes on in the gospels and a lot is going on in Mark's gospel during Passion Week. Mark 12 is taking place between that triumphant entry and that last supper. We're in the few day period in between those two Events, and I'll, I want to remind you if you were with us, and if you weren't with us, you can go back and hear all these messages online and be able to follow along through this series in Mark. But the last two messages we had, we were on the Temple Mount, and there were three waves of questioning coming at Jesus. Maybe you'll remember this. And the first wave was those Pharisees, and they formed this unholy alliance with these Herodians who weren't aligned with them in their views at all, but they got together and came up with a question. And as a group, they came at Jesus to try to entrap him in his words. And their question, they thought, however he answers this, we've got him. They thought either the Romans are going to arrest him. It was a question about taxes and uh, understandably that can make anyone upset. And so uh, they thought either the Romans are going to arrest him or the crowds are gonna turn on him. We've got him with this question. But their plan backfired as the crowds marveled at the response that Jesus gave. And that was the first line of questioning from the Pharisees. And then the Sadducees came and they came with a question to display their theological supremacy. They wanted to demonstrate that they understood the scriptures better than Jesus and discredit him in front of the crowd. So they brought a question they thought was sure to demonstrate that he was wrong and that he did not correctly understand the scripture. But does anyone else remember that in John 1, the scripture said the word became flesh and dwelt among us? I mean, they're challenging the word of God in flesh. He's the author of those scriptures. Certainly he knew them better than those Sadducees. And so he answers their question in such a way that really they they end up being put to shame. Jesus doesn't like really attack them hard, but, but it's just clear that they did not understand the scriptures and that Jesus correctly understood the the scriptures. So you're maybe sensing a theme here of these three waves of questioning in these first two, and neither of the first attempts found their target. Neither the Pharisees nor the Sadducees were able to question Jesus in such a way that their intended outcome was achieved. And today we encounter the third wave of questioning on the Temple Mount during Passion Week with the tensions rising and these leaders hating Jesus more and more, the very leaders that are soon to put him to death. And this time, a scribe approaches Jesus to ask him a question. Now, after the first two interrogations, we would expect perhaps another ramrodding and railroading question that would just come at Jesus and try to attack him and his person. But as we'll notice, as we work our way through this passage, this encounter and this third wave of questioning is different from the start. Let's look at it in our Bibles in Mark 12, beginning in 28. The scripture says, and one of the scribes. Let's stop right there. In the first two waves of questioning, it wasn't an individual from one of those groups. Those groups were getting together to conspire against Jesus. 
But this one's already different because it's not the scribes coming. Jesus deals with them later. This is one of the scribes. It says, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. He had been listening to these questions and to Jesus' response to the questions and seeing that he answered them well. All right, hard stop right here. This is where we get the surefire. We know that this is of a different tone already because none of the Pharisees or Sadducees would have ever considered Jesus to be answering them well. They thought that what Jesus was doing was challenging their authority. Their answers made Jesus, uh, or I'm sorry, Jesus' answers made them hate Jesus even more. But this scribe's heart was soft and he was willing to hear Jesus. And the scribe asked him, which commandment is most important of all? Now, that's a pretty significant question if we can understand a little bit about who scribes are. And I think right here is a good place to insert that. Scribes were tasked with this incredibly important job of preserving the scriptures, preserving the word of God, specifically that portion in the scriptures that we call our Old Testament. That was the Jewish scriptures that the scribe was responsible to preserve. Their task as a scribe was to not let one jot or one tittle or in English, one period or one comma, no punctuation at all, passed. They were gonna make sure that everything in that law was written down to perfection. And they devoted their lives to this meticulous task of making copies of God's word so that it would not be changed or lost. Well, how did they do as a group? Oh my goodness, the history and the manuscripts we have, the accuracy in those copies, how far they stretch across time, the volume of manuscripts we have and the very, very minute uh, differences that none of them are significant deviations indicates that these scribes were incredibly proficient at preserving the scriptures and doing their job. The manuscripts of scripture reveal that there were no substantial differences. And you know, they did all this without computers. I mean, they were like the supercomputers of their day in the way they handled those scriptures and made sure that the word of God was preserved. So what I'm saying is this scribe knew the commandments. He had devoted his life to writing down the word of God over and over and over again and studying it and seeking to understand it. And of all the questions, here he is with Jesus. He hears that he's answering others well. He has a question he wants to ask. And of all the questions this scribe could have asked about the law, he decides to ask this question. Which commandment is most important of all? What a question from a scribe. How would Jesus answer him? Jesus answered him like this. He said, the most important is, whoa, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God in human flesh was just asked a question about his law for Israel. And the question he would at, was asked was, which is the most important commandment? And now from the lips of God, from the lips of Jesus, we get to hear God's value. We get to hear what God thinks the most important commandment is in all the law of Moses. And Jesus answers and says, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. There are 613 commandments in the law of Moses. And according to Jesus, the other 612 find their place of importance behind this one. Jesus said it was the most important commandment. And Jesus could have stopped right here, but he didn't. He felt compelled to give another commandment as part of the answer. He continued, the second is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now the scribe had asked for a single greatest commandment and Jesus gave him two. For Jesus, these two commandments were inseparable. 
To love God is to love your neighbor and to love your neighbor is to truly love God. That's how Jesus answered this third round of questioning. Now the question is, based on this answer that Jesus gave, how would the scribe respond? Well, the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. Okay, we know again that this guy is very different than the Pharisees and Sadducees that came before him. His heart posture was not like the others. Jesus' answer made them hate him more, but Jesus' answer to this particular scribe made him respect him more and agree with him more. The scribe continued, you're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength is to, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. This is a scribe, a Jewish scribe saying that this commandment is much more than the sacrificial and offering system that God had prescribed for Israel to keep in covenant relationship with him. When I read that much more, the first few times I read that in studying this week, tears just filled my eyes. It's hard for us to appreciate the magnitude of what this scribe is saying because we're not Jews and we're not scribes. But for him to say that the, these two commandments are much more than all the sacrifices, much more than all the offerings, what a significant statement. And this scribe agrees that these two are most important. Man, and Jesus when he saw that he answered him wisely, Jesus was pleased with his response. Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, I feel like that's the punchline of this story. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Don't forget that punchline. We'll come back to it as we work our way through this. Let's remember it. And then the story concludes with no one dared to ask him any more questions, would you? <laughs> I mean, here they are on this heated temple mount. It didn't go so well. And then the one who came with a soft heart, man, that also went in Jesus' favor. We're done. We're not asking any more questions. In this story, Jesus expressed what is the most important commandment to God. And he said, the most important commandment to God is to love God with your entire being. In the Bible, Jesus was the first prophet to call this commandment the first and the great commandment. We find that in a, another account in Matthew 22, a separate instance, but a similar environment where Jesus is also teaching about the greatest commandments. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 22. He says, or someone asks him, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Sound familiar? And, the, and, the, and then he says this, this is the great and first commandment. Jesus called that commandment the great and the first commandment. And then he, he had it on. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So let's ask some questions about this great and first commandment. Why did Jesus call this commandment to love the Lord your God with all your being the great and first commandment? Well, he called it first because it is first in perpetuity. I'm gonna explain what I mean. It's the first in perpetuity. If you were to open your Bible, begin searching through the law of Moses, and if you were to look through there and look for the commandments as they're listed in order, you would not find this commandment listed first in order. So when Jesus says this is the first commandment, he can't be talking about the order in which the commandment appears in the text. Dozens of other commandments are listed before it, but he calls it first. So if it's not first in order, how is it first? It's first in perpetuity. And here's what I mean. Perpetuity means lasting forever. This commandment is first in perpetuity. Jesus called this commandment first because this commandment to love God with all of our being has always existed. It is an eternal commandment. When God created the first angel, 
this angel knew that commandment. When God created Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve understood this commandment. All of us instinctively know this commandment, that we are to love God more than we love ourselves. Even the atheist knows in their conscience to love God with their entire being. Before Satan fell from heaven, he knew this commandment. We call Satan's great sin a sin of pride, right? And we call it a sin of pride because we understand that Satan wanted to be like God. But at the root of that pride was this, his love for himself and his love for himself that was greater than his love for God. Ultimately, Satan exchanged his love for himself for, for his love for God. And when he did that, he broke the first commandment. When Adam and Eve sinned, they did the same thing. They loved themselves more than they loved God and they broke the first commandment when they ate the fruit. You know, sometimes we can look at that and we can think, why is this so severe that they would bite into a piece of fruit and that it would bring about the curse of sin and the fall of mankind? Well, it's not the eating of a piece of fruit that is so catastrophic. It's the breaking of this first commandment. It's loving themselves more than they love God. Jesus calls this commandment first because it is first in perpetuity. It is a commandment that lasts forever. That means that this commandment will never end and has always existed. Loving God is the first commandment. So Jesus called it first. And then why did Jesus call this commandment the great commandment? Well, he called it the great commandment because it is great in priority. This commandment is great in priority. Remember in Mark to the scribe, he called it the most important commandment. Of the 613 commandments, he called this one the great one. That means this commandment takes priority over all the other laws that God gave to the nation of Israel. It's the only, or, or it is the greatest commandment in priority because God knew that this commandment was gonna have to be kept in order for any other commandment to have a chance. In other words, keeping any of the other commandment flows out of this great commandment. It starts with loving God. If Satan had kept this commandment, he would not have rebelled against God and led others to rebel against God. But because God was not his first love, he chose to put himself first. Then Adam, he led Adam and Eve to do the same thing. And then he's led, Satan has led every other descendant of Adam, Adam and Eve to do the exact same thing that they did. And all of us, like Adam and Eve, have broke this great commandment. If we would love God, we would not have broken the other commandments. But we have all sinned because we have loved ourselves more than we love God. And ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, every human being, save Christ, has done this exact same thing. Jesus called this commandment the first and great. It's first because it's first in perpetuity. It stands and lasts forever. And it's great because it takes priority over all the others. And keeping any other commandment is always dependent on starting with this one commandment. So why did Jesus call this commandment first and great? That's why. But I think there's another question we need to ask. Why should we want to keep this first and great commandment? Isn't knowing a commandment and motivation to keep it two totally different things? I mean, I've heard it said that the lo longest distance for something to travel sometimes is the 12 inches between my head and my heart. You know, I need something greater to motivate me. Why should we want to be motivated to keep this first and great commandment? Well, when God gave this commandment to the Jews, he gave it to Moses in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. And I want you to see this passage here. This is the commandment Jesus cited to the scribe on that temple mount when he quoted the law of Moses. And he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, this passage right here is a very significant passage in Jewish culture. This passage is known as the Shema. And it's one of the most important passages to them in all of the scripture. And notice in the Shema, and Jesus also recited it when he said it to the scribe, notice that God doesn't start by commanding people to love him. 
That's not how the Shema begins. God started by telling us who he is. It begins right there. God told them he is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is one means this. It means he's the only God. There is no other God but him. You're not God, I'm not God, and there are no other gods. He is the only God. In the ancient world, when this was written, other, all the other nations around Israel believed that there were multiple different gods. In today's world, there are many people who believe there are many different ways to get to God or that all the gods of all these other religions are ultimately the same God. But in the Shema, in that passage in Deuteronomy, God's word says both these beliefs are not true. God revealed to Israel that he alone is the one true God and there is no other God beside him. We should be motivated to keep the first and great commandment because of who God is. He is the one and only God. But the Shema doesn't stop there. The Shema also tells us we should be motivated to keep this first and great commandment because our God is Lord. God told them he is Lord. Now that Hebrew word Lord means that God is the creator of all things. Everything that exists is created by God and that includes you. He's the owner of all that exists because he created all that exists and nothing that exists, exists apart from him. Not only that, but that word Lord in Hebrew means that God is the sovereign ruler over all that exists. Everything is in his control. Nothing is outside of his control. And that means this word Lord also means that he is supreme. He is the first, he is the last, and he is everything in between. He is supreme over all that exists. We, well, let me use an I statement. I tend at times to feel my opinions and feelings and my, my way of thinking is supreme. Can anyone else relate to that, that I, the way I feel? Listen, that feeling is not rooted in truth. Our opinions, feelings, and our view of ourselves are not supreme. And our opinions and feelings about ourselves will never be enough to motivate us to keep God's first and great commandment. We must be motivated by believing the truth about who God is. Our view has to turn outward. We have to look at him. And when we look at God, we see that he is one and he is the Lord. And who he is should motivate us. It should be the motivation to keep these first and greatest commandments. After God revealed this to Moses, God told Israel how they should respond to these realities about him. He told them, that their, he told them their response and he told them their response in the form of a commandment. And the commandment was this, that Israel should love the Lord their God with all their being. Now remember on the temple mount and Jesus and the scribe. The scribe actually recognizes the importance of this commandment being tied to the Shema, being tied to who God is as a motivation to keep the commandment. Look again at the scribe's answer when Jesus told him the greatest commandments in Mark 12, 32. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one. You hear him repeating who God is? You've said he is one and there is none other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So this guy, he was getting it. He was understanding, man, my love for God has to come out of my view for God and my understanding of who God is. And he agrees with Jesus. He agrees with the Shema. The scribe's answer is celebrated. And after it celebrated, Jesus said to the scribe, the punchline, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, hold on. Put yourself in the scribe's shoes for just a moment. How reassuring is that to you? That Jesus would say, way to go, man. Love your answer. That's wise. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Now, why didn't he say, wait, you're you're in the kingdom of God. Isn't that what you would want to hear Jesus say? Way to go. You agree with me. Your values align. You, we see the commandments the same. Why did he not say, you got it. You're in. Welcome to the kingdom of God. 
Because as good as the scribe's understanding was of the most important commandments, Jesus knew that the scribe had fallen short of keeping them. The law of God is not enough to motivate or empower anyone to keep the commandments. And Jesus knew that this scribe, even though he agreed, had broken both of the most important commandments. The best God's law can ever do is not make us perfect. The best law God's law can ever do is reveal our inadequacies and show us our need for something greater than the law. That's why Paul says in Romans 3, 19 through 20, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Since since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Paul's saying the law can only point you to an understanding of your inadequacy to keep it. And when... Jesus was speaking to this scribe. He knew that even though the scribe agreed with him, he had failed to keep the law. And the scribe had to become aware of his failure to keep the law in order to enter the kingdom of God. Because church, listen carefully, a relationship with God's commandments, even the most important commandments that God gives will never be enough for us to have a relationship with God and enter into his kingdom. Jesus knew that this scribe, all the Jews listening on the Temple Mount, and you and I hearing this story today would need something even more significant than the most important commandments in order to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. So isn't there one more question we have to ask? Then how do we enter it? How can we enter the kingdom of God? Well, I'm grateful that even though the questioning stopped where we stopped reading, the story doesn't stop where we stopped reading. You see, Jesus continues on. After he says, you are not far from the kingdom of God to the scribe, he immediately turns to the crowds and he teaches them a lesson about King David and he speaks to them about the kingdom of God and King David. And here's how we can enter the kingdom of God based on what Jesus told them. To enter the kingdom of God, we must believe that Jesus is Lord. There is no other way to enter the kingdom of God. The only way, not through your works or your relationship with the commandments, the only way for you to enter the kingdom of God is to agree with God that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus turned to the crowds and told them this story about David because he wanted them to see that. Listen in Mark 12, 35 through 37, what Jesus says. Right after saying, you're not far from the kingdom, he didn't leave him hanging. And Jesus taught in the temple. And he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, that's an important phrase, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So, Jesus quotes this Psalm from David. And then he says this, David himself called him Lord. So how is he Lord if he is his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. All right, now I understand if you're sitting there going, help me get this, we're not Jewish. So these prophecies and what the Psalms say, we might need a little help understanding what Jesus is insisting and asserting about himself in his response to the crowd. You see, Jesus was referring to a prophecy written in the psalm by King David. Psalm 110, 1 is where that is found. And in that psalm, the scripture says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That is what David wrote. And here's what we need to understand because we're not Jewish. We need to understand that Jesus and the Jews listening to him agreed on this, that in that psalm, in its context, David was referring to one of his future descendants as Lord. That's what we have to make sure we wrap our mind around. David in that psalm on the screen was referring to one of his future descendants as Lord. And now how absurd is that? And that's actually the point Jesus was making. Like, come on, how can this be that David would refer, what grandfather in this room would refer to his grandchild as Lord? You remember what Lord means, right? Creator. 
I mean, it doesn't go that way. It goes the other way around if there's any kind of procreation happening here. Supreme, sovereign ruler, what grandfather in his right mind would call his grandchild Lord? It's absurd. But that's what David did in this song. And Jesus asserted in the story, put up the next slide, that David was in the Holy Spirit when he made this declaration. Now, it's unclear how much David understood about his future descendant when he wrote this prophecy and called him Lord. We know by the end of David's life that David believed the promise of God that God was going to establish his throne forever. We know that by the end of his life, that God had made this Davidic covenant with David and with Israel. And we know that David believed God's promise that one of his descendants would sit on the throne and rule and reign forever from that throne and that his kingdom would know no end. So we know that David understood this covenant, had this knowledge of the covenant. And we know that David trusted the promises of God. But there's no reason to believe that David would have understood how God was gonna bring this about. I mean, David could just be sitting there going, whoa, God, you said some pretty bizarre stuff to me. This might be one of the most bizarre. I'm not sure how you're gonna accomplish that one. I believe you, but I don't know how you're gonna accomplish that one. It's not clear how much David understood when he wrote this Psalm and called a future descendant Lord. We may not know exactly what David understood, but we know what Jesus understood. We know that Jesus understood that he is Lord. He's the creator, the sovereign ruler, and he's supreme. We know that Jesus understood that he was the descendant of David that David was speaking about. And we know that Jesus understood that God would establish him on the throne and that his kingdom would never end. Jesus knew that he is Lord. Jesus understood it. How can we enter the kingdom of God? We will, it will never be enough to enter the kingdom of God through our relationship with the commandments. Jesus made that clear when he told the scribe, you're not far from the kingdom of God. We've all fallen short of keeping those commandments and the evidence is clear. We've all sinned. And that's what the scripture says, right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No, to enter the kingdom we must call Jesus Lord. We must agree with King David and call Jesus Lord. We must agree with Jesus and call Jesus Lord. If we're gonna be saved from our sins and enter God's kingdom, we must agree with the Apostle Paul in Romans 10 and we must call Jesus Lord. Remember Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Your efforts My efforts, your works, my works to enter the kingdom will never be enough. To enter the kingdom, we must enter through relationship with the king. We must call him Lord. Now I gotta ask before I move on, have you ever done that? Have you ever called Jesus Lord? You know, it really starts right here and ends right here. This is the way to enter the kingdom. And there is no other way to be in right relationship with God other than calling Jesus Lord. Do you realize that no amount of good things you do could ever make you right with God? Would you believe that this morning? That if you put all your energy and effort into it, you still through your works would not be able to make yourself right with God? Do you understand that the only way to enter the kingdom is through relationship with the king, to call Jesus Lord? I believe God's moving the hearts of people right now to call him Lord. What does that look like for you to call him Lord? Let me just give it to you really, really simple. To call him Lord means this, put yourself in the right perspective. Stop elevating yourself as the most important thing in this world. Humble yourself before God. Recognize that he made you. He is sovereign and supreme and he rules over all that exists and that includes you. Recognize that you're just a blip on the radar. And then realize that your sin is catastrophic. And the reason it's catastrophic is because you've loved yourself more than you've loved God. That sovereign Lord and creator 
you decided that your self-interests were more important, that you should esteem them higher than him and recognize that because you've sinned, it has broken your relationship with God and that there's nothing you can do to fix that. You already sinned. You already broke the relationship. You've already broke the most important commandments. And then believe this, that God, that Lord loves you. And he loves you so much that when he saw you in that state, he decided that you were worth suffering for, that you were worth living for and you were worth dying for. And he came and he lived the perfect life that you failed to live. And he loved with the perfect love that you failed to love with, where you did not keep these greatest commandments, he kept them all. And even though he's perfect and God and never did anything wrong, the scripture says that he went and he died on a cross. He didn't deserve that. Why did he die on that cross? The Bible says he died on that cross to atone for your sins because of his great love for you. He loved you so much that he decided to love you more than he loves himself. This commandment, the second commandment in the law, Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus didn't stop with loving you as he loved himself. Jesus decided to love you more than he loved himself. And he gave up his life suffering and dying on a cross. If you wanna ever know how catastrophic your decision to love yourself more than God is, look at the cross. Look at Jesus hanging and suffering and dying. He did that to pay for your sin so that you could be made right with God. If you wanna enter the kingdom, you need to believe this is true about Jesus. And you need to believe this is true that his life did not end with his death. That's a funny thing to say. Don't we think life ends with death? Not for Jesus. Jesus went to the grave with your sins, but on the third day, he rose again from the dead by the power of God. And he's alive and his resurrection, you know, I can claim to be God. I can claim to be, I won't, I don't want to, but I could make the claim. I could say I'm God, I could say I'm Lord. And you'd say I'm crazy and you would be right in doing that. Jesus made the claim, but he backed up the claim. Because when he rose from the dead, he proved that he is Lord. He proved that he is God and he proved he has power over sin and death. And the scripture says that if you will believe that that's who he is, and if you'll adjust your life and say, here I am, you are Lord, you'll enter the kingdom. You will enter the kingdom of God. Imagine how much you could try to work and how your works would fall short. You could devote the rest of your life to trying to be perfect and you wouldn't get it done and you still might, you might get close to the kingdom because you agree with the commandments and that is good, but you won't enter the kingdom. The only way to enter the kingdom is believe that Jesus is Lord and then just say, you are Lord and he'll change you. Say, you are Lord. And when you enter the kingdom, all these new benefits start becoming yours. He changes your life. He changes your heart. He changes your standing with him. He changes your relationship with him. He changes the way you live. He changes your view of yourself. He changes your view of others. And you become this new thing. That's how you enter the kingdom. You call Jesus Lord. I wonder if we could bow in prayer right now. I do believe God's moving some hearts to call Jesus Lord. Is he moving yours? If he is, would you just pray this prayer to the Lord right now, right where you're sitting? Just say, dear Jesus, you are Lord. I have sinned and I've loved myself more than I've loved you. Please forgive my sins and make me a new person. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll look up at me for just a moment here. And I love this part. If you just prayed that prayer, I love being the first to tell you this. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future, they're gone. They're atoned for. All the work you could have ever done would have never done that. 
and simply by believing who Jesus is and calling him Lord, God forgives all your sins. And not only are your sins forgiven, but you have a new life in God. Now, if you went and looked in a mirror right now, your face probably looks the same, except, I don't know, maybe you might be smiling or something. (laughs) But other than that, you probably look the same. But you're not the same. The Bible says that who you really are, that inner person, dies with Christ when you believe he's Lord. And that you're born again of the Spirit of God and you're made a new thing, a new creation in Christ with new desires and new longing and guess what? A new capacity to love. And with that new thing comes this new desire to do whatever Jesus says because he's Lord. And you understand that now. And did you know that there is a test in the Bible that really tests your heart to determine whether or not you truly believe Jesus is Lord? immediately after you profess Jesus to be Lord, the Bible says the next thing you need to do is be baptized. You need to be baptized. Baptism is this sign. It's this outward sign of that faith. The water of baptism represents a grave. And what we're saying is I was one way, but that old me has died. And then you come out of that water, like coming out of the grave and you're saying, and I'm alive as a new thing. And baptism is this, prophecy about the future. You're saying, I have this body and like Jesus' body, one day this body's going to die and it goes under the water, under the grave. But you say, just like God raised Jesus by his power from the grave, God is going to raise me up too and I'm going to have everlasting life with him. Baptism is this wonderful picture of our sins being sent away, us being washed by the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus and what he did for us. Baptism is a great picture and baptism is not complicated. It's so simple. You don't have to prepare a speech. You don't have to get up here and tell everyone your backstory. You don't have to do any of those things. Jesus gave this test that any of us could do that would test our hearts to determine, is he really Lord? Because unless he's Lord, you can't enter the kingdom. And he said, hey, if you confess me as Lord, the first thing you need to do is profess me as Lord through the waters of baptism. And so we have a team. I'm going to ask them to come forward, our response team at this time. And I'm going to ask all of you if you would stand with me at this time. And I want you to know how we roll at Together Church. I know that there are people here who did not come thinking, I'm going to get baptized today. But we're ready for you. We want you to be able to profess Jesus as Lord right away, like Jesus tells us to do. There's a change of clothes up there. There are towels up there. We are ready for you to come and be baptized. The question is, have you truly professed Jesus as Lord? And if you have, and you've entered his kingdom, and he is your Lord, will you follow him as Lord and just do what he said to do as a sign of faith? Will you be baptized? And so here is our first, and I would say most important invitation this morning. If you have professed Jesus as Lord, whether that was in the last five minutes or the last five days or five weeks or five years, or even the last 50 years, but you have not been obedient to him as Lord by professing your faith through the waters of baptism, will you confess he is your Lord today by being baptized? This is God's plan. This is what he calls us to do. And so if that is you, I wanna ask you right now, would you come forward if you wanna be baptized? These people are ready to receive you up front and they'll talk with you about your decision, but come right now. Who needs to be baptized? Who has professed Jesus as Lord and is ready to obey him as Lord? Come on this way. Right here, let's celebrate Sonny, praise the Lord. Jeremy, you wanna go over there? Man, that's what we're gonna do is just celebrate. Is there, and uh, Jeremy and Sonny have actually been in a discipleship relationship for a while. And Jeremy's already met with Sonny. I didn't know if he would come forward today or not. So praise the Lord for uh, Sonny's decision. Is there somebody else who needs to be baptized and profess Jesus as Lord? I'm waiting because I know sometimes our feet just get glued to the ground. 
and we need just a minute to pick them up. <laughs> All right, well, could we celebrate one more time with Sonny and Britt? You guys can head out if you would like. Would you tell Britt that they can go ahead and head out? All right, and you can be seated for just a moment. So here's what's exciting about that. We're gonna get to cel celebrate a baptism today. And uh, Sonny and Jeremy, Pastor Britt, are gonna go and get ready for that baptism. And so while they're going, um, I, I wanna bring this home for you in the church. All right. Let me bring this home for you in the church. I know that on an invitation for baptism, the reason many of you didn't respond to that invitation was because you've already been baptized. You've already followed the Lord through the waters of baptism. So how does this first and great commandment apply to us as disciples of Jesus? Well, if you've entered the kingdom of God by calling Jesus Lord, the Bible says that God's Holy Spirit has entered you. So you enter the kingdom and God's spirit enters you. And there are all kinds of blessings, all kinds of benefits for you in the Bible when you enter the kingdom. But there is one benefit that is very pertinent to the message today about the greatest commandments. And that benefit is this, God's love has been poured out in your heart through the Holy Spirit. It says that in Romans 5.5. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, when God enters you, he gives you his power to keep the first and greatest commandment. And that commandment was a commandment you could not keep on your own. But because God's love enters you, you can abide in that love. And you now have the power to keep the commandment that previously you were destined to break because it's not dependent on your love anymore, it's dependent on God's love. But that's not all. Not only is it possible for you to keep the most important commandment to love the Lord your God with all your being, but because of who God is, it's now possible for you to not just keep that second most important commandment, but to exceed it. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You see, when Jesus shared the second most important commandment with the scribe, he told him what the second most important commandment was in the law of Moses, okay? But we're not Jews and the law of Moses is not for us. Later, Jesus got with his disciples and he did not recite to them the second commandment when he talked to them about love. Later, Jesus got with his disciples and he said, I have a new commandment about love for you. And this is what he said on the night before he was betrayed during Passion Week. He said in John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, my disciples, that you would love one another. And he said, he didn't say, like you love yourself. He said that you would love one another as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this will all people know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And then Jesus went and became a curse for us and died on a tree. And he loved us more than he loved his own life. What a commandment. I wish I could describe love for you this morning. Like really, I wish I could stand up here and tell you what love is like. But listen, if it could be described, I'm not even sure that all this would have played out where Jesus came and died like that. For us to really know love, we have to experience love. And we experience love, we've all experienced it because Jesus Christ gave up his life for us. I wish I could explain love, but I could probably talk about it till I'm blue in the face and you would go, yeah, yeah, that's good, that's love. But until you experience love, you don't really know what love is. I experienced some love yesterday. Uh, put up the picture of the trenches. This is happening at my house right now. My, somewhere between my main shutoff and the meter at the front of my house is a leak that is getting worse and worse. And so looking into options, just thinking about, man, how do we approach this and come at this financially? And as I talk to people and, and my dad and others in our church, 
um, I felt so loved that a group of guys was willing to come and get in the trenches with me yesterday. We literally, what? And Rachel, and Rachel was out there in the trenches with me. Yeah. And we, uh, we literally sweat and bled and dug and baked in the heat and got sunburned and laid on the ground and slopped out wet dirt mud for several, several hours yesterday. And these guys showed up and they were willing to give up a Saturday, give up their time, bring their own tools at their own expense and help me dig this hole so that I could try it. It's not fixed yet. We didn't quite find the leak, so we're gonna keep working on it. But step one and one of the most labor intensive, if not the most labor intensive step is done. We've uncovered the line going to the house. You know what? I can talk about love or I can experience love. And it's hard for me to relay to you this morning how much love I feel by this. But if you've ever had some people love you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm telling you that for many of these guys, they loved me more than they loved themselves. Some of these guys would have probably just paid a plumber and been done with it and not got out in the trenches like that. Love is not something I can describe to you or explain in a commandment. If you wanna experience love, you gotta get in the trenches. If you wanna experience love, you gotta be willing to get dirty with people. Have a relationship that's real. And in that relationship, give love and receive love. And that's the only way for you to really know what love is. Jesus knew you needed to experience love, so he got in the trenches and died on the cross for your sins. Came to this earth and lived a perfect life. God knows, and his plan is that for you as his disciples, that you would keep not that second commandment for the Jews, that you would keep the new and greater commandment that he has given us, that we would love one another as Christ has loved us. So here's my challenge for you in the church, and then we'll conclude with a baptism. My challenge is this. Are you in the trenches with anyone right now? If you're not, you're missing out on love. You need to be willing to get in the trenches and experience love. And hey, some of you go to a small group and you're still not in the trenches. Some of you come on Sunday morning and you're still not in the trenches. Some of you volunteer and serve in the church and you're still not in the trenches. To move past a superficial, yeah, I'll do it, it's the right thing to do. Listen, keeping the commandments will never give you right relationship with God. Keeping the commandments will never help you experience God's love. It's gotta come from who you are. His love has been poured out in your heart. You're a new creation in Christ. Get in the trenches with someone and love them. Find someone that needs the Lord and love them and share your life with them. Wherever you are in the journey, be that for someone else and let others be that for you. It was really hard for me to lay down some pride and let guys come dig in the trenches at my house. I'd rather dig in your trenches than you come and dig in my trenches. But to invite other people in and say, you can be part of this with me. I have a problem and I need help and to let others love me and then for me to love them. And listen, I hope you get it. Digging in the trenches, that's just an analogy. That's just a metaphor. It's more about the heart and the relationship. It may never, it may sometimes look like getting dirty like these guys did yesterday, but other times it looks like just being there for them spiritually, answering their questions, arranging your life, arranging your calendar. I heard one pastor recently say there's this great disparity between the Christians who are debating whether or not they're gonna gather for worship at the cost of their lives in the world today and Christians who are, uh, who are debating whether or not they're gonna do the soccer league on Sunday morning. And there's a great disparity between those two. Listen, love immediately recognizes the problem with that. And love says, I'll get in the trenches with you. Love says you gotta be here, not because it's the right thing to do that you go to church on Sunday, but there's someone for you to love here this morning and you've got to be here to love them. Love says you gotta be in small group because God wants to say something to you and through you to other people and he wants to build relationships and you gotta be there to love. Love elevates a priority for other people. Love adjusts its life 
love like Jesus lays down its life and even love someone else more than you love yourself. I'm not always willing to do what's in even my own best interest. Can anyone else relate to that? I drank a Coke last night, I shouldn't have. You know, I'm not always willing to do what's even in my own best interest. Genuine love loves even more than self and goes on beyond what you would even be willing to do for your own well-being, that you would do it for another's well-being. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So we ought to lay down our lives for each other. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, we're gonna be able to conclude with a baptism here in a few moments. And I'm not sure, uh, it doesn't look like we're ready. So I'm not gonna just have you sit there and and, uh, chill out. We're gonna be able to talk and fellowship here. But I wanna encourage you during this time or before you leave, go back to that join a group wall if you're not in a group and find out that's where it would start at Together Church, getting in the trenches. Go and join a group and be part of relationship with others and look for ways to love. So uh, if, you're, if you need to go, we understand during this time you can slip out, but I hope all of you, or at least the vast majority of you will stay and we'll celebrate this baptism with Sonny. So thank you so much for being here this morning. And for now you're dismissed and we'll come back together for a baptism. In a-